Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Eric Owens. I'm the Associate Director of the Boise Center for Religion and American Public Life. And uh, we're so delighted to have such a great audience and especially two uh, terrific speakers that will precede an energetic conversation uh, later on this evening. As you can see from the screen, our event is co-sponsored by the Environmental Studies Program, the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, and the Institute for the Liberal Arts. And I want to thank Professors Noah Snyder, John Ebel, and Mary Crane for their support, along with the Boise Center staff who have put so much effort into the planning and promotion of this event. A special welcome to those of you watching live on the internet. Uh, thanks to our friends at Front Row for making that happen. This uh, video recording of this event will be available immediately afterward, so you can watch it again and again in case you miss the, the drippings, the bon mots that are sure to come. Um, I ask that you silence your cell phones uh, so that we're not interrupted in our conversation, but uh, you don't have to put them away because we are tweeting uh, this event at the hashtag climate denial, which you see down in the bottom right of the screen, and you can follow the Boise Center's feed of this event on our Twitter account, uh, Boise underscore center. And we encourage you to do the same. Uh, as is our custom, we will be leaving lots of time at the end of the presentations for a conversation with you. And uh, if you're in the room, you'll just raise your hand to ask a question. If you're out in the ether somewhere, you can tweet us questions and we'll be sure to uh, gather some of those before the time is up. In the face of a robust scientific consensus that the Earth's climate is slowly changing, and that humans are at least partly responsible for this change, a persistent and vocal minority of skeptics and some outright deniers has gained traction in American public discourse. Some of the climate change skeptics focus their criticism on scientific findings about global warming trends. Many others deny human responsibility for these trends. But in both cases, religious beliefs about God's sovereignty often undergird the skepticism and influence the larger debates about how societies can mitigate climate change or adapt our way of life to adjust to these new realities. I need to add that it's another matter entirely to disagree, whether on religious or non-religious grounds, about what we ought to do and for whom in the face of climate change. This is not skepticism or denial about science, but a crucial discussion of ethics and outcomes. But the climate change denial movement, if we can call it that, fascinates me, and over the past year I've tried to understand its religious claims in order that we might find a path forward in our civic discourse that both respects religious believers and allows a serious conversation about the scope of the problem and the range of possible responses. Among the most vocal climate change deniers is the Cornwall Alliance, an evangelical group that has developed a website and a curriculum entitled Resisting the Green Dragon. And uh, the green dragon, of course, is environmentalism run amok. And this website and this group claims to serve as a, quote, biblical response to one of the greatest deceptions of our day. But there are other groups, and they all tap into a broader sense among many religious believers in this country that there's a fundamental conflict between religion and science as such. A recent poll from the Public Religion Research Institute found that 54% of Americans believe that science and religion are often in conflict. And these people, this is off, not part of the poll, these people connect this conflict across a wide range of issues from human evolution to the origins of the universe to human responsibility for climate change. National Geographic recently had a cover story entitled The Age of Disbelief, arguing that skepticism about science has hit a new peak and has polarized our national conversations about public policy. This summer, a very large new front in this religion and science conversation will open up when Pope Francis releases his much anticipated encyclical on creation, the environment, and climate change. We will hear much more about it this fall when, the, when he visits the United States and speaks to a joint session of Congress and to the United Nations General Assembly. But to help us make sense of all this in advance of that and also many of the things that are, that are swirling around in different parts of this conversation, we have invited two exceptional scholars today, one an evangelical Protestant and the other a Catholic, to talk about the relationship between Christianity and climate change denial. Our lead speaker is atmospheric scientist Catherine Hayhoe, who will present for about 35 minutes, followed by a 10-minute response from theologian Steve Fope. And allow me to properly introduce Professor Hayhoe, and we'll get started. Catherine Hayhoe is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech University and director of the university's Climate Science Center. 
Her research focuses on establishing a scientific basis for assessing the regional to local scale impacts of climate change on human systems and the natural environment. She's a founder and CEO of Atmos Research, which seeks to provide relevant information on climate change's effects to a broad range of nonprofit industry and government clients. And she's a scientific advisor to many environmental groups. Her work has been featured in over 100 peer-reviewed papers, abstracts, and other publications. And she's presented her findings on climate impact assessments before Congress and many state and federal agencies. With her husband, Andrew Farley, she's the author of the book, A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions. And her work as a climate change evangelist that's her term, uh, a good one, uh, was recently featured on the documentary series Years of Living Dangerously, first broadcast on Showtime last year. I understand they're about to film a second season of that. Her work on that program with actor and environmentalist Don Cheadle accounts, I think, for the fact that Cheadle retweeted her post about this event to his nearly 300,000 followers yesterday, and I welcome them online. Uh, in 2014, Professor Hayhoe was named by Time Magazine as one of the most 100 most influential people in the world. And that same year, Foreign Policy Magazine listed her as one of the 100 leading global thinkers. It was indeed a good year last year. She received her bachelor's in science in physics and astronomy from the University of Toronto, a master's and PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please help me welcome Professor Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, for coming on this rainy, cold day. Um, it's kind of a rule that whenever you're going to talk about climate change in April, there is an ice storm, a snowstorm, a sleet, or a hailstorm. <laughs> so that's why the weather is what it is today. This is such a unique event. Usually, when you're asked to come speak somewhere as an academic, they let you pick, kind of pick your own title. But this title was chosen for this event, Religion and the Roots of Climate Denial. Now, when you're invited to give a talk with a, pre with a preset title, you can do one of two things. You can either completely ignore it and pull up your PowerPoint from last year about the relationship between Pacific teleconnections and drought over the central US. Or you can sit back and you can say, what do I think about this topic? And so that's what I got a chance to do. I got a chance to use this picture, which I love as the title too, because I think this perfectly sums up what we're talking about here. We're talking about belief, and we're talking about science. One is data and facts-based, and the other is what's going on in here. So thinking about this topic, I came up with five thoughts that put together I really believe, start to tell us a compelling story that helps us understand what is going on. The first thing we know, though, is that we cannot deny that every time we turn on the TV or go to our favorite news site, we are smacked upside the head with headlines like this all the time. The issue of climate change is constantly being conflated with religion. Starting at the beginning, we have quotes such as, the climate of the globe has been fluctuating ever since God created it. So from the beginning until now, it's always been going up and down, and then continuing on. From now onwards, it will continue to change because of the way God formed the earth. And then eventually, the earth will end only when God declares it is time. It will not be destroyed by man. Just, a, just an interesting note, it's always man, never woman. We're off the hook. <laughs> Other quotes go on to talk more broadly about the issue of science, climate, and faith. Like this quote saying correctly that 97% of scientists polled believe that humans are doing this. Many of the same scientists, 97 perhaps, believe there is no God. So scientists, like the rest of us, can have beliefs, but that doesn't make it science. I would just like to say as an aside here, aside, <laughs> that one of my personal favorite researchers is a woman called Elaine Eklund. She's a sociologist who studies science and religion. Now, it makes me a little nervous whenever I'm around Elaine because I feel a little bit like a lab rat. 
But Elaine's research is so useful because she has surveyed scientists at top research universities, and so she actually has the facts. And the facts are that nearly half of scientists at research universities identify with a specific religious label. I am a blank. Nearly one-fifth attend church services more than once a month. And for those of us familiar with the academic life, that's a pretty hefty commitment. So, sir, that statement is not correct. Going on, though, we see surveys. This is a survey from the Pew Foundation that came out in 2008, but subsequent surveys come up with almost the same numbers. This survey asked, and I will read it because I know this font is tiny at the back there. The survey asked, is there solid evidence the world is warming? And the light green is yes because of human activity. The very light green is yes because of natural causes. Then we have yes, but we don't know why, and orange is no. The Pew Foundation broke out people's responses by everybody in the US, then people who are not affiliated with any specific denomination or church, then we have white mainline Protestants, white non-Hispanic Catholics, black Protestants, and finally at the bottom we have white evangelical Protestants. 34% say yes, there is solid evidence the earth is warming due to human activities, and that means that roughly two-thirds say it's not. Going on, a more recent survey by PRRI asks how concerned are you? And again, it looks at all Americans, how concerned are you about climate change, and then it breaks it out by denomination. And here it gets interesting, because we see that Hispanic Catholics are very concerned about climate change. In fact, they are the most concerned group, and they should be, because Chihuahua is going to turn into a desert, even more than it is already. But what do we have at the bottom again? We have our white evangelical Protestants, and we have our white Catholics. Welcome to my world. So we can't deny that there is a clear correlation between certain denominations and climate denial. Not only that, but here is the next thing I noticed. It isn't just that we hear people saying things and that we see the results of surveys. It is that the issue of climate change is being both deliberately and perhaps accidentally framed as a religion. What do I mean by that? Well, let me be very clear. One day I expect to see a copy of this picture with my head photoshopped onto the choir. <laughs> so far I don't think any of those heads are mine. There are many, many websites out there where you can find people saying things like this is a false religion. This is an alternate religion that is being presented and we must resist it because it is heresy. But it isn't just a framing coming from the people who don't think climate change is real. What do I mean by that? Well, just two days ago, the Yale Forum on Climate Communication, which is a tremendous resource, if you're not familiar with them already, you definitely want to be, they released a series of interactive maps where you can go down to the county level and look at all kinds of different information regarding people's opinions about climate change, including this map, which they very carefully and accurately titled as the estimated percentage of adults who think that global warming is happening. Again, adults who think that global warming is happening. I like that wording, that's correct. Do you think it's happening or not? Um, this story was reported on by many venues. The story in Bloomberg picked up on this and said, what Americans think about climate change. This story was picked up by Grist, a magazine which I read quite a bit. What did they call it? Meet the United States of divided climate beliefs. What are they doing there? Subconsciously, I would venture to say, they framed it as a word that is much more strongly affiliated with religion than it is with science. They weren't the only ones. Vice went on to say, do you believe or deny climate change? Here's why this is a problem. It's a problem because 
in the United States, 77% of people identify as Christian. And that means that 77%, or maybe let's be conservative, 76%, are not looking for a new religion. So when we come along asking people if they believe in climate change, what does that sound like? It sounds like we're trying to convert people to a new religion. In a population where about 76% already have a Christian religion and most of the rest already have a different religion. I think only 18% are really truly unaffiliated. So that's why I really appreciate when people take the time to be careful about the words they use. Like this fantastic article from, three, uh, from last month that said, you can't believe in climate change because it isn't a religion. You can say I believe in gravity or I don't believe in gravity, but if you jump off the cliff, the same thing is going to happen. And climate change is the same way. We can say we believe in it or we don't, but that doesn't affect what's going to happen. So that's why I think it's so important to clearly distinguish between what is science and what is faith. So one of my favorite verses in the Bible is this one. This is the Hey Ho Revised Version. <laughs> in Hebrews 11, the author of Hebrews defines faith for us as the substance of what we hope for and the evidence of what we do not see. Here's the beauty of it. Science is the opposite. If I had been sitting there beside that person 2,000 years ago, I would have dug their elbow and said, hey, you forgot the second half. Because science is the substance of things that are here and now and the evidence of what we can observe. And if you don't believe me, we'll just go to Google, because Google is, of course, the arbiter of truth in our society. <laughs> this is Google's definition of science. The systematic study of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment, as opposed to faith, which is a belief based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. So what I would posit here as a hypothesis is that Faith and science are not and should not be in competition, especially with the issue of climate change. In fact, we need both of them to correctly not just understand the problem, but to figure out what to do about it. But before I go there, we have to acknowledge point three, and that is that there certainly are some religious sounding arguments out there, right? I think we can all think of some. I saved the best one for last. This one. God is still up there, and the arrogance of people. Now, I'm sorry, but we women are not off the hook here. I said people. The arrogance of people to think that we human beings would be able to change what God is doing in the climate to me is outrageous. This is the number one most common objection that I hear when people talk about climate change. People who have a very strong faith. It's the idea that climate change challenges the sovereignty of God. Here's the thing though. There's verses in the Bible that talk very clearly about how we reap what we sow. In Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, you asked, is everything permissible? Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Our choices have consequences. Do bad things happen to good people in this world? Yes, they do. Do our choices have consequences? Yes, they do, and we see that all the time. What is climate change other than a consequence of choices that we have made as a society over the last 300 years? Now, don't get me wrong. Back 300 years ago, we didn't know that digging massive amounts of coal and natural gas and oil out of the ground and burning it would produce all this carbon that's building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around our planet, causing it to heat up. We didn't know that 300 years ago. And also, don't get me wrong, the Industrial Revolution has brought us many benefits. I personally don't think I would be alive today if it wasn't for the benefits that medicine has brought us. I had a terrible accident when I was a year and a half old, fractured my skull, ended up in the hospital for I don't know how many weeks, 
and I probably would have died if it wasn't for the benefits that technology had brought us today. I have a bump on my skull that's literally three inches thick, if anybody ever has to identify me. <laughs> now you know. But now we do know, don't we? And in fact, the surprising thing is we've known for well over 100 years that all of this burning of coal and natural gas and oil produces a change in our climate. We do know what the consequences are now. So it isn't a case of challenging God's sovereignty. It's a case of acknowledging that God has given us a brain and free will to use to make decisions with. That's not the only objection we hear, though. We also hear, and you'll see me cite this PRI study quite a bit because they ask such great questions, that people are much more likely to attribute the severity of natural disasters to the end times than to climate change. Corollaries of this, which you may find featured in a scientific and biblical expose of climate change, <clears throat> are that, for example, God said there will always be seasons, or that the world will never be destroyed by flood again. The world's going to burn up anyways. In fact, maybe this will just hasten it. Um, God gave humans dominion over the world to do whatever they want. And also, the religious-sounding argument of, well, it's not fair to deprive other nations of their chance to develop. This is pretty much all of their religious-sounding arguments in one slide. So let's go through these very briefly, one by one. Why do we have seasons? We have seasons because of the orbit of the Earth around the sun and the fact that, as that gentleman just said, the tilt of our Earth is inclined towards the sun. Is climate change affecting the orbit of the Earth? No. So there's that one. Sea level is rising. Do we expect sea level to cover every square inch of land on this planet? No. We don't have enough ice in all the ice sheets to do that. So we do not expect the world will be destroyed by flood. What if the world is going to end anyways? Well, back in Thessalonians, they were asking that same question. That's why you got to love the Bible, because lots has changed in the last 2,000 years, but I'll tell you one thing that hasn't changed, and that's humans. So about 2,000 years ago, there were some people sitting around saying, the world's going to end anyways. Christ will return any day now. Let's just lay around, quit our jobs, twiddle our fingers, eat, drink, be merry. It's all going to be over next week. And the Apostle Paul wrote to those people, and he said very sternly, he said, get a job, support your family, care for the poor and the needy and the widows, because you do not know the day or the time. And in the meantime, we are called to love others and care for others, not sit on our behinds, acting like there's nothing we can do in this world. Now that is a bit of a paraphrase again, but that's kind of the sense. <laughs> and then you have questions like, well, if God gave humans dominion, doesn't that mean we can do whatever we want? Well, picture someone who is a CEO of a big corporation. They have dominion over that corporation, correct? Do we respect them if they run that corporation into the ground? No. We respect them if they invest in it, if they help it develop to reach its full potential, if it is healthy and thriving. That's who we respect. And so even from that perspective, we don't respect people who run things into the ground. And the last one, it isn't fair to deprive other nations of development. No, it isn't. But when you go to Africa, are they putting in party line telephones all over Africa? No, they aren't. Everybody has cell phones there. Why is that? It's because they're leapfrogging right over all our old and efficient technologies. Do they have infinite resources of coal in Africa? No, they don't. But I'll tell you what, they do have sun and wind. So yes, I think people should have the chance to develop, to experience the benefits of the life that we have here. But they don't have to do it the same old, dirty ways that we did. When we look to the Bible, we see very clear guidance on how we are to view this issue. Now, there's no verse that says climate change is real. There's no verse that says cut carbon emissions 92.8% and you'll be OK. And there's no verse that says the true price of carbon is $42 a ton. It would be helpful if there was, but there isn't. But there are verses <clears throat> that tell us, for example, that we see God in creation, which implies a value to the world around us. I was recently in Utah, where someone at BYU said something to me that really 
struck me. It was a quote about how nature is the illustration to the Bible. The Bible is the written word, and the world around us, which science reveals, are the pictures. We're told very clearly, as you can see, I like my different translations here. We're told very clearly the earth belongs to God and that it is valued by God. We're told even farther that God made humans to be responsible. Have you seen that before? God made humans to be responsible for, dump to the bottom, every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. And we're reminded that when we're given a trust, we are to be proved faithful to that. That whatever gift we're given, we're supposed to be faithful stewards of. And so this is where the creation care movement comes from. The idea of stewardship, of caring for what we have been entrusted for. It has a solid biblical foundation. And many Americans agree with that. 57% say God gave humans the task of living responsibly with animals, plants, and other resources, not just for human benefit. There is a verse in Revelation, though, and I believe the Pope knows this verse. The verse says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth, which is kind of a <clears throat> bit of a strong statement. It isn't just about the earth, though. Here's the thing. In Texas, we have a lot of signs. This is one of the good signs. I like this sign. We're told very clearly that we are to have a heart of compassion for people as well. And when we look at where our carbon emissions have come from over the past 100 years, one third of those emissions have come from the United States. Alaska is kind of guilty by association here. It's mostly the lower 48. When we juxtapose this figure with a figure of who is suffering the impacts of climate change, you can see what I'm talking about. These are the nations where people are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. So that's why I would argue that the stewardship theology is incomplete. It isn't just a matter of caring for everything but humans or baby seals over humans. It's a matter of caring for all life on this planet, human or otherwise. Because when we look at climate change, it raises major issues of justice between those who have and those who have not, and between us here now and future generations who will be paying the price of our choices today. So using religion as an excuse, as a smokescreen, to hide behind in climate denial, I believe is a perversion of our true faith. James even goes on and tells us what pure religion is. To care for others, orphans and widows in those days particularly, and to keep oneself undefiled from the world. So I would argue that when we talk about climate change, it's not a theological issue. It really isn't. It really, at its core, does not have to do with our faith or what we read in the Bible. If that's not the case, then, what does it have to do with? And that was my next thought. Which, let's see. There we go. <clears throat> we know that challenging the authority of God is the most common spiritual argument, but studies have shown that the real problem lies in the solutions. But it's a lot easier to say it isn't a real problem than to say it is a real problem, but I don't want to do anything about it. What is the first step in AA? Not that anybody here knows that personally. Yes. Um, when I was young, back a very long time ago, there was a small mustard-colored booklet that Christian organizations would hand out called The Four Spiritual Laws. First statement, I admit I'm a sinner and I need God. Admitting we have a problem is the first step and it's the hardest step as a human to take. So my fourth idea out of five is this, that the real roots 
of denialism do not lie in religion as the title of this forum suggests. They lie in ideology communicated to us through politics and the media. Why do I say that? Let me build my argument. If we look at political polarization in the United States, back in 1994, Democrats and Republicans weren't that far apart. By 2011, people had moved quite far apart. And by 2014, not only had the distance increased, but for those of us who are statistically minded, the distributions were becoming skewed away from each other. Why is this important? Well, first of all, it turns out that, according to research from Stanford, the number one predictor now of who you will marry if you are not already married, just so you know, is not appearance, it is not personality or character, it is political affiliation. Isn't that horrifying? Yes. I would just like to be clear, I come from a country <clears throat> where you don't ask people what party they belong to. I had never had a single person ever ask me what I was before I moved to the United States. And I personally have voted for at least three different political parties in my lifetime. So this, this identification of myself, my family, my community, my church as belonging to a certain party has enormous repercussions throughout the United States. And here's one of the biggest ones. When you ask people, what do you think of this issue X? And then you say, are you Democrat or Republican? A researcher up at UNH, just up the road, Larry Hamilton, did this. And his results were confirmed by the midterm elections last year, too. He tabulated the issues on which Americans are most divided politically. The number one issue is what it should be. The number one issue is the performance of the president. And that should be something that divides you, because otherwise, why are you one or the other, right? For those of you with good eyesight, take a look at this. What is the second most politically divisive issue in the United States? Climate change. What is number four? Do you trust scientists? <laughs> okay, let's just back up a second here. Um, do you see, do you trust accountants anywhere on there? Do you see, do you trust lawyers anywhere on there? No. So why do you trust scientists? Why is that a political issue in the United States? And then you have the Arctic and weather. Apparently, your opinion on weather depends on whether you're Republican or Democrat. <laughs> it's not just Republican and Democrat, though. Let me put a couple more pieces together. Americans who identify with the Tea Party, which is not the same as Republican, are even more skeptical about climate change, 53% don't think it's happening, or because of humans. Now, let's fit the pieces together here, okay? Also, nearly half of Americans who say they're members of the Tea Party also say they're part of the religious right, okay? Now we're starting to connect the dots. In fact, three quarters of those who identify with the Tea Party would describe themselves as a Christian conservative. And if you look at support for the Tea Party divided out by religious affiliation, who is at the top, all right? So what I love about sociology is you can start to tease these questions apart. So my colleague John Evans asked this question. He said, okay, we know that conservative Christians, which he termed fundamentalist Protestants, and I said, John, you know those are fighting words. He said, yes. <laughs> conservative Christians are less likely to believe the conclusiveness of climate science. Do you notice that pervasive word again? Belief, yes. However, here is what they found. Controlling for other demographic properties showed that it is, let me translate this, not going to church that causes the divide. Participate in fundamentalist Protestant discourse. Going to church is not where the divide occurs. These opinions are rooted in age, in political conservatism, and in political affiliation. So why do evangelicals disproportionately disagree with climate change? It's because they're disproportionately members of the Tea Party. And the Tea Party disproportionately disagrees with big government solutions to problems. That's the logical connection. And in fact, other work 
by Robert Burle has found, for example, that the number one predictor of our opinions on climate change is what he, and I will translate this again, what he calls elite cues. What is that? That means who we respect as a thought leader. Because we are all cognitive misers. All of us. Yes, even you. We are all cognitive misers because we do not have all the time in the world to figure out every nuance of the arguments on immigration or stem cell research or tax reform. So what do we do? What do you do? You turn on the TV or you go to your favorite website, right? And that's where we get our opinions from. And in fact, if I can find my mouse here. Oh good, I just found my mouse. In fact, the emergence of what they call congenial media, which means you can find somebody saying anything you want on the internet, including that the moon is made of cheese and the world is flat. The emergence of congenial media has been fingered as one of the major drivers of political polarization in the United States over the last 20 years. 20, 30 years ago, what did everybody do? They turned on Walter Cronkite. Today, what do people do? Grandma's in the kitchen listening to Fox News. Joey's in his bedroom listening to what people are saying on, tw on Twitter. And then somebody else is there watching Stephen Colbert in the living room. We're all listening to what we like to listen to. And that is why we're so polarized, because all we hear is what people tell us. So what do we hear in the media? Well, in 2013, if we turned on CNN, 30% of the information on CNN about climate change was false on CNN. If we turned on other stations, it was a little worse. <laughs> but this was better than the year before. The year before, it was over 90%. They've gotten better. So what does this do for evangelicals? I have news for you. You may not know this, but we don't have a pope. So what does that mean? Well, we do have pastors, and our pastors talk about climate change. Um, <laughs> 5% talk about it often. 25% talk about it sometimes. But you know what, Catholics? I'm sorry. You're in the same boat. So if our religious leaders are not talking about this, who fills the void? Right? And that's why denying the science has become an article of faith that is required to belong to our tribe. Not just that, but there is legitimate fear involved too. We are afraid of the solutions that have been offered to us. Why was the American Revolution fought? Look for some of the words on this slide. Yes. Why are you surprised that people don't want climate change solutions that involve words like taxes and government restrictions and Uncle Sam telling me what to set my thermometer at? It's because it is burned in the American psyche to resist government interference in people's personal lives. And the National Association of Evangelicals even says this right out. This is the government relations director from the NAE, Galen Carey, who says many evangelicals oppose actions to slow climate change, but they don't do it because of a religious basis, but they do it because they believe the government wants to take away their freedom. It's the solutions we fear, not the science. But it's easier to say the science isn't real to say it is, but we don't want to do anything about it. So my last thought is this, though. My last thought is that we need our values, we need our faith, and we need our religion to understand what to do about this problem. It isn't a case of separating science and faith. It isn't a case of saying there's separate magisteria. We do the science over here with climate change, and we do the faith over here on Sunday. No. We need our faith, and it has been hijacked. It has been taken away from us and used for evil rather than good. Why do we need our faith? We need our faith because we are not asking for a small change in our society. One of my favorite historians, Jean-Francois Mouhot, when he was at Georgetown University, he wrote this. He said, an economy run on slave labor has much in common with one run on fossil fuels. Today, each of us 
would require an average of 200 people biking 24 hours a day to supply the energy that we use. Now, if it was Lance, Lance Armstrong, maybe we just need 50 people a day. <laughs> we replaced slavery in our society with fossil fuels. What did it take to do that? A lot. Who was at the forefront? Evangelicals, Christians, people of faith. Their voices were key in moving us forward. And so today, we have a similar movement. We have this movement going on right here at Boston College, and we have it going on at Harvard right across the river. We are being asked to divest, to cease from earning money from fossil fuels. But we are not asking for a small change, and that is why our values and our faith are so important here. Because, and this is a strange thing for a scientist to say, science is limited. Here's what science can do, okay, in four slides. Number one, science can tell us that climate really is changing. This is global temperature. It goes up and down from year to year, but long term, it's getting warmer. Science can do that. Science can tell us that if our temperature were being controlled by the sun right now, we'd be getting cooler because energy from the sun has been going down the last 40 years. Science can tell us that if it were normal natural cycles, one part of the earth would get, be getting warmer while the other cooled. But now, from the bottom of the ocean to the top of the troposphere, the whole thing's warming, so it can't just be a cycle that moves heat around. And science can also tell us that if we look at the ice age cycles, we aren't still warming after the last ice age. That warming peaked 8,000 years ago. And in fact, according to ice age cycles, we should be heading into the next ice age, and we're not. We're getting warmer faster and faster. That's what science can tell us. And science can tell us one more thing, and this is what my research does. This is my own research, in fact. Science can tell us what the future will look like depending on the choices we make today. That's what science can do. But nearly every country in the world has agreed 25 years ago to stabilize heat trapping gas levels at an atmosphere that would prevent dangerous human interference with the climate system. 25 years ago, we all signed on to this treaty and we proceeded to argue about it ever since. Why is that? It's because dangerous is not a scientific choice. How much is too much? Is there a magic number of cigarettes where we can smoke up to that number and we stop right there and we will not get lung cancer? No. Is there a magic number of tons of carbon dioxide that if we produce up to this amount but no more than that will be okay? No. It's too late for many people up in the Arctic where the villages are crumbling and falling into the ocean because the permafrost is melting. We've already passed that level for them, but we haven't for many other areas. So when we look at things like the conference of parties taking place in Paris later this year, the 21st conference of parties to the treaty we all signed 25 years ago, we need our faith and our science there to make good decisions. Because what is dangerous is not a scientific decision. It's a decision we have to make based on what's in here. And so that's why I think our faith is so important. And this is really my favorite verse. You wouldn't connect this with climate change, would you? It's a verse where Paul is writing to Timothy and says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. When we hear all the rhetoric surrounding climate change, what emotion do we pick up? Fear. Fear that the world is ending because of too much carbon. Fear that the world will end because we do something about it. Fear that the government will take over our lives. Fear that the government won't do anything. It's fear. This is not what we've been given. We've been given a spirit of power to get stuff done. I love that. We've been given a spirit of love to care for others, to care for every living thing on this planet. And here's the best one. We've been given a sound mind. And what a gift that is. That's why this verse is such a source of personal encouragement to me. That's why our faith matters, because I believe that I have been given a sound mind and a spirit of love and power to act rather than cowering in fear when confronted with not only the threats that I receive personally, but with the global threat that we pose to people here on this planet. It's not a guilt thing. Someone once said to me, 
You know, every time you turn on your car, you're sinning. And I live in Texas. If I don't turn on my car, there's nowhere to go and nothing to do. So I did not take very kindly to that remark, I hate to say. Um, in fact, I felt like going, getting in a large, large vehicle and just driving circles around the parking lot. Sinning! More! <laughs> I didn't do it. That's not what we read here either. We read that the only thing that counts is our faith expressing itself through love. And that's what climate change is, is an opportunity to express our faith through love. So that's why I'm going to close with a quote from one of my favorite scientists, who I grew up watching movies of when I was a little girl, Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall was reproached for naming her chimpanzees. She was told, you are losing your objectivity as a scientist. You are personalizing your subjects. And she replied after reflecting on this for 40 years. Just this year, she said, it's only when our clever brain and our human heart work together in harmony that we as humans can achieve our full potential. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, uh, for a terrific beginning to our conversation. We really appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is Professor Stephen Pope, who is Professor of Theology here at Boston College. And his very popular courses uh, range across social and theological ethics, with particular focus on, the, on uh, science and ethics, on St. Thomas Aquinas, and on virtue. He's the author of the books The Evolution of Altruism and the Ordering of Love, as well as the Human Evolution and Christian Ethics and the editor of scholarly books on St. Thomas Aquinas and on Jesuit liberation theologian John Sabrino. Uh, Professor Pope received his BA from Gonzaga University <coughs> and an MA and PhD in theological ethics from the University of Chicago Divinity School. Please welcome my dear friend, uh, Steve Pope. Thanks, Eric. Um, can you hear me OK? OK? How's that? Better? I'll try to enunciate. I still think Gonzaga could have beaten Duke. If you just had another, <laughs> another 10 minutes, they could have pulled it off. But this is a different kind of war. Um, I'm going to try to speak uh, clearly and quickly, because I've been given 10 minutes, and I'm trying to show self-restraint over a topic that we can all talk about for hours and hours. Um, this is a cover of National Ge Geographic last, week, uh, last month, March 2015 on the war of science and lists a variety of topics on which um, the data and findings and accounts by scientists are, are becoming highly contentious political issues in our society. Um, on the website for National Geographic, there's a list of the gap between what scientists offer as their best uh, uh, data, their best theories, uh, their best sometimes policy suggestions, um, and the public perception of those, the public treatment of those topics. And I want to call your attention to the first. Uh, the, 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 the second is the gap between uh, US adults, uh, their opinion about the environment and the climate, and those of scientists. It's quite a stirring gap. And uh, Catherine mentioned some of the reasons for this. Um, I'm going to look at a few principles in Catholic theology. So I'm doing kind of a Catholic co counterpart to Catherine's evangelical theology, because I want you to see that there's a tremendous convergence theologically between two positions that often people think are at odds on many fundamental questions. In fact, of course, as the world is more pluralistic, the more Catholics and evangelicals are, see themselves as partners and cooperators rather than as competitors. Um, but the first is St. Augustine, who's, I think, the most important theologian in the history of Christianity, who had the most impact. And Augustine held uh, and, and really defined mainline Christian uh, biblical interpretation up to the present time. He argues that the Bible cannot be properly understood as affirming what is true, as affirming as true what natural science teaches is false. I'll clarify, say it differently. For St. Augustine, absolutely nothing that is found to be true by well-established scientific methods 
contradicts a proper interpretation of Scripture because they talk about different things. Okay, That's the first thing, fundamental to Christianity. If a Bible, passage, a Bible passage refers to natural phenomena in a way that contradicts the finding of science, Augustine says Christians should defer to the latter, to science. Not across the board, but well-established scientific findings. For example, Augustine says that when Genesis describes a light created before the sun and the moon, it cannot refer to physical light because physicists show us that there cannot be physical light without a luminous source, that we know that this particular passage does not refer to physical light. Science helps us interpret the Bible. It's not hermetically sealed in a separate compartment. The same thing applies in modern period, modern Augustinians, that is when I say modern, I'm talking about 17th, 18th century, um, to language the Bible talks about using common sense perception, the sun rises in the west, west and sets in the east, and people use that against Galileo. He said, you can't contradict the Bible. Galileo quoted Augustine to say that you have to read the sense of Scripture and not interpret Scripture as if it's trying to give us a scientific account of the natural world. Thomas Aquinas, the most, uh, I think, influential Catholic theologian, held identical, the identical position. True science, he says, cannot contradict the truths of faith. Why? Because God is the author of all truth. If we think there's a contradiction somewhere, we have to figure out where we've gone wrong. God is the author of all truth, and whatever reason discovers to be true about reality ought not to be challenged by an appeal to sacred text. He says if you appeal to sacred text to, to contradict science, you're just going to discredit the sacred text. You're going to discredit the Bible. You're going to discredit theology. John Paul II, no liberal, held that faith and science and this Thomistic tradition complement one another. And he says not that they're in separate compartments, not that the theology is up here and science is down here and they're not relevant to each other. In fact, he says there should be cross-pollination for the health of both. Science can purify religion from error and superstition. Religion can purify science from idolatry and false absolutes. Each can draw the other into a wider world, a world in which both can flourish. Properly construed theology gains creativity and vitality by being engaged with science and is not threatened by it in the least. Catholic ethical principles complement this theology. This is very shorthand. The Catholic ethical principles regard what we do with scientific information, what we do with our technology, because science and technology by themselves are simply tools for understanding and for acting in the world. Firstly, the Catholic principle that we ought to protect human life and dignity, use science for the protection of human life and dignity. Secondly, the justice is not just about individual contracts and rights, but about the common good. How do we promote the good for the whole community, not just for the elites? Thirdly, the virtue of solidarity enjoins us to take responsibility for one another. Not one another is in my own family, my own tribe, my own community, but all members of the human race, and particularly, as we'll see, the most vulnerable. Thirdly, Catholic ethics conceives of freedom as responsible self-determination and civic participation, both belonging and freedom related together rather than as simply radical autonomy, each of us needing to establish ourselves over and against others is not the Catholic approach to freedom. Fifthly, stewardship for human communities, habitats, and the planet as a whole. Sixthly, the preferential option for the poor, giving special attention, priority to the disadvantaged, both locally and globally. And of course, this is especially important for climate change, as you saw in the beautiful graphic put up by Catherine, that the people that are, that are suffering the most, the burdens from the burdens of climate change, are people in the southern hemisphere. And then finally, that we make moral decisions through the virtue of prudence. Prudence deals with contingencies. Contingencies are ranges of possibilities. And that's where we need to be informed by science. If you don't have the facts, you cannot make good prudential judgments. But you can't make good prudential judgments with uh, overriding, ignoring 
uh, cherry picking facts as well. So from these the these theological principles and from the ethical principles the US bishops have drawn recently and they make this claim. In facing climate change, we, what we already know requires a response. It cannot be easily dismissed. Significant levels of scientific consensus, even in a situation with less than full certainty, where the consequences of not acting are serious, justifies and indeed can obligate are taking action intended to avert potential dangers. If enough evidence indicates that the present course of action could jeopardize humankind's well-being, prudence dictates taking mitigating or preventive action. So we could say, put this in the context of what Catholics are actually uh, polled as saying, and actually the polls seem to be all over the place. We saw several very grim uh, polling numbers from Catholics, about 14% of, of of white Catholics take climate change as a serious issue that happens that they worry about. Uh, some basic facts, 83% of Catholics would endorse an international agreement, this is in a, in a poll done at the University of Maryland, that we need to reduce greenhouse gases. 35% polled saw this as an obligation to protect God's creation. I can't imagine what else they thought it would have been, but anyway, that's what they say. 44% um, saw it as an important goal, but not in terms of an obligation to protect, protect God's creation. And then 25% did not see preventing climate change as an important goal whatsoever. So I'm going to look briefly at five ways one might oppose climate science, on what grounds people oppose climate science. The first is that you don't know. This is the dueling experts problem. You really don't know, so you're going to side with people that are saying what you're inclined to say. And this works if there are legitimate scientific arguments on both sides of the debate, but it doesn't work if 97% of climate scientists say there's only one legitimate position to take on this. Secondly, you can reject scientific claims on scientific grounds. But this requires credible scientific reasoning that at least is seen as plausible by peers in peer-reviewed journals. Thirdly, people can know the scientific arguments but reject them on moral grounds. But I think this is a, is a serious error because it confuses taking a moral position, that is, concluding what we ought to do, with coming to an understanding of what the situation we're actually confronted with. As Catherine pointed out, there's an attempt to short-circuit short, short the moral position, the moral arguments, out of fear of where they might lead us. The, fifth, the fourth possibility is knowing the scientific arguments but rejecting them on theological grounds. I think that we've seen that there are no evangelical grounds, biblical grounds, for rejecting climate science. And I'm going to show it. I think that there, there, is, there are no theologically respectable Catholic grounds for doing so, although we have very limited on time here, so maybe we can pursue it further. And then finally, there's a, the possibility of knowing the scientific finding, findings but rejecting them on political grounds. And some of these you are familiar with, responding to the over-centralization of political power in big government. The problem is that scientific findings as such do not dictate social policy. That those are human choices that we have to make. But they're better made on the basis of sound rather than unsound science. And a political goal does not warrant ignoring or denying scientific findings, particularly when it comes to something as important as climate change. So here are some Catholic reasons for denying climate change. These are some of the major, some of the major Catholic politicians in Congress, both the House and the Senate. First of all, there's the jury is out argument. So Paul Ryan says, Sci I don't know, and neither does science. Secondly, climate scientists are either incompetent or politically biased, is the second kind of argument. And you can see John Boehner, for example, says that science is almost comical. I'm not sure where he finds the humor, but uh, Rick Santorum says it's absurd that we could change the climate. Uh, thirdly, there is just the flat out stubborn view of Marco Rubio. I just don't believe it. You can say whatever you want, but I'm not going to believe it. And then fourthly, there's the, the, the theological argument. This is the only one I could find. There are probably others. Uh, this is the only one that is repeated the most, and it's the God's sovereignty argument, that God's sovereignty disallowed human disallows human-generated climate change. Representative Virginia Fox says the climate, climate is God's creation, and that climate hawks think that we human beings have more impact on the climate and the world than God does. 
Again, that's a massive non sequitur, but that's what she says. Um, Rush Limbaugh, who's not a Catholic, thank God, says, <laughs> says that to be, to be uh, Rush Limbaugh says to be, to be a believer in climate change, you have to be an atheist. Because what it says is that God doesn't have care over creation. So Catholic politicians, to continue, Catholic, uh, I think the first three are all versions of the expertise argument that ignore the scientific consensus from, the Na from NASA, from the AAAS, from the uh, Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change, and many others. The, third, the fourth is a theological argument that misunderstands the nature of divine sovereignty and human stewardship. And none promote a moral, politically motivated rejection of climate scientists. None say that. But whether they say it, whether it's functional, are two different questions. But I want to just look at one theological question, because it is distinctively, there's a distinctively Catholic approach to this that I think is helpful. And this is the relationship between divine sovereignty and natural causality, that is, systems of natural causality. This is the standard Catholic approach you can see in the work of Thomas Aquinas, and it's still used by Catholic philosophers today. This is that God causes creatures to exist in such a way that they are the real causes of their own operations. God is at work in every operation of nature as primary cause. But the autonomy of nature is not an indication of some reduction of God's power and, or activity. Rather, it is an indication of God's goodness. That is to say, for Aquinas, God's goodness is expressed by allowing creatures to be empowered because God's power is not threatened by our agency and by the power of nature. In fact, it's, God is glorified by the power of nature by the goodness and order and beauty of nature. So because divine causality and creaturely causality function at fundamentally different levels, we can rely upon natural science to tell us about the functioning of natural phenomena. And in fact, it's the only thing that will tell us methodologically, um, in a disciplined way, the way in which natural phenomena function. So from a Thomistic standpoint, sovereignty and causality are not competitor, the natural caus causality are not competitors. In fact, one requires the other. This relates to the question of stewardship. Um, sometimes you have a comp competitive view of if God is sovereign, we don't have to be responsible. We're not in charge of the world, people say. Stewardship is a word we use for talking about how we as rational creatures participate in God's creative and providential care for creation. Stewardship is made possible because we're intelligent, although not always rational beings. We are rational beings in our nature. Stewardship is responsibility to care for creation, not irresponsibly to dominate and exploit it. This is a big debate by scripture scholars over the interpretation of what it means to, to have dominion over the earth from the first chapters of Genesis. John Paul II infers from this notion of sovereignty, providence, and stewardship the following. He says, we must encourage and support the ecological conversion, which in recent decades has made humanity more sensitive to the catastrophe to which it has been heading. Man is no longer the creator's steward, but an autonomous despot who is finally beginning to understand that he must stop at the edge of the abyss. The pope thinks we could destroy the planet God respects our freedom so much that we could destroy ourselves. It's a great statement of a belief in human dignity, but also a great statement of the danger that we are in and a call to realism. It's really a challenge not just of more scientific education, but of cultural transformation. Now, I'm almost, I'm almost at the end of my slides. A couple of important points. Catholic Climate deniers tend to be Republican, especially in the Congress. And their emphasis on individual rights, skepticism about government, and strong resistance to regulatory mechanisms that would reduce carbon emissions makes it easy to pin the blame on a political party. But I believe that liberal Democrats who are indifferent to faith help to make devout Christians suspicious of climate science. It's a cultural perception problem, and it's profound in this country. 
I think the new atheists, who are very aggressive in attacking Christianity, who appeal to science in their polemic against religion, do even more damage to the public acceptance of science. They are damaging our, the ability of many people to take climate science seriously by the polemic that they take out against all and any and all forms of religion. Science literacy, an important study done just recently at Yale, science liter found that science literacy correlates with polarization in climate science, not consensus. That is, the more people get scientifically literate, the more they find evidence to stockpile for their own ammunition for their own position. People use science to confirm beliefs that reflect their wider worldview. Confirmation bias is rampant, except among theologians. <laughs> so simply communicating the findings of climate science will have limited effectiveness in changing attitudes that reflect our primary group, group loyalties, which are social, religious, moral, and political. It's an issue of your tribe. This is a, a kind of approach to epistemology that neuroscientists talk a lot about, and I think it's pretty convincing. So prominent climate scientists, to no surprise, have recently called on religious leaders to use their moral authority to challenge the motivated reasoning of climate skeptics and to counter their public message. So Pope Francis himself says, the time to find global solutions is running out. There is therefore a clear, definite, and urgent ethical imperative to act. The establishment of an international climate change treaty is a grave ethical and moral responsibility. Just two more slides. First, what are the implications of this on a ground level? Well, first of all, I think that there's a major and perhaps that this is a major and probably the central moral challenge of our age. It should not be regarded as a partisan political issue in which science is up for grabs. There is too much at stake for it to have that status. Secondly, Catholic priests and bishops, speaking here to, as a Catholic, have a responsibility to preach about the climate, climate crisis, to educate future priests in seminaries, and to inform and form Catholics about this critical issue. I stress the form, not just inform, tell them the facts, but help them shape their imagination in a way that is marked by those ethical, seven ethical principles I mentioned. And Pope Francis's upcoming encyclical that Eric mentioned is timed to give strong support to UN deliberations on measures that must be taken to avert potential catastrophe. If you want to know more, there are two resources. One is in this room. Dan DeLeo, Dan the man, is working with Catholic Coalition for Climate Change. And you can go to this website and find out all sorts of information that's helpful, um, challenging, informative, and very useful for these conversations we're having tonight and elsewhere. Thank you very much. So I'd like to invite our speakers to join me up front here for a conversation. We'll make sure that our mics are turned on. Can you all hear me OK? Well, um, I have a lot of questions and comments that I could start with, but I think it's uh, best that we turn to the audience. So if you have a question, we have a microphone uh, somewhere. Where is Evan? Uh, here, he's got a microphone here. So go ahead and raise your hands and we'll queue up the questions as they come. And if you're watching from online, you can tweet a question with the hashtag climate denial. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you so much. My name is Andrea Strimling Zampa. I run Deploy US. We're working to build conservative support for action on climate. Uh, and I have two questions. Um, one is how important is focusing on quote unquote deniers or skeptics right now? They're a very vocal uh, group, but they're a minority. So should our attention be much more on building the salience of this issue among people who already think there is some issue, even if they don't think it's the most important issue? That's one. And the second is, as we look at 
opportunities to help political conservatives embrace this as their own issue and not just sort of a progressive issue. Um, how um, potentially valuable are collaborations and alliances across sectors with some of the less expected leaders on this issue, not just religious and moral leaders, but also national security and military leaders, corporate executives and others, um, uh, political influencers from the conservative and libertarian communities like that. So those are the two, two questions I'd appreciate your thoughts on. Great, thanks. Catherine, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, one of my favorite re resources is probably one that you're familiar with too, which is the Six Americas of Global Warming. So the reason why I like it is because it surveys people across America and asks them what their opinions are about climate change and puts people into six groups. It starts with people who are dismissive. That is the hardcore people who I like to think of as, you know, if an angel from heaven with tablets of stone in flaming letters saying climate change is real appeared to them, they still wouldn't agree. So there's that group. Then there's people who are doubtful, people who are disengaged, people who are cautious, concerned, and then people who are alarmed. Here's the thing. The alarmed and the dismissive groups are the ones we often hear from the most in the media, but they're the smallest groups. So in answer to your first question, I do not focus on the dismissive group. Now, if somebody asks me a question, in a public forum, I certainly respond, but I'm not really responding trying to change their minds because nothing will. I'm responding to talk to people who are doubtful or disengaged or cautious. Now the second question about engaging voices, I think that's essential and all of our top communicators in climate in this country are doing exactly that. Um, because we've been told for so long that climate change is a green issue, a tree hugging issue, an environmental issue. Climate change is not that, it's a human issue. It's a water issue, it's an energy issue, it's a food issue, it's a health issue, and it's definitely a business, an economic, and a national security issue. So those are the voices that we need talking about it. Steve, what would you say? I say I agree with you. All right, all right. <laughs> he gets the next question. <laughs> it seems to me that climate change would be the ultimate conservative issue. Mm -hmm. You're in, it's conservation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't mean that in a blue way, but I mean, aren't we all concerned about conservation? And don't want to be, don't want to be responsible human beings, and don't want to be, don't we want to be accountable human beings? Those are all conservative values. They're also liberal values. The polarity is unhelpful anymore, I think. Yeah. Um, and I and I, it seems to me that um, you're right. We don't, to, to talk about the extreme ends, this is the fact that most people are somewhere in the middle, and um, I think. Speaking as a theologian, the church has an urgent moral responsibility not to allow it to continue to be seen as a liberal issue. Um, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, Pope Francis, you can dice them and slice them in all sorts of different directions. They don't fit into the liberal conservative polarity we have here. Um, that's a polarity created by the media, I think, because it's for convenience and sells press, sells, sells time on television. They're all people with, with different approaches to politics, perhaps, but they're all telling us that we have a great responsibility to protect the goodness of nature that we have right now. How can we convince people to do that we, if, we on, if only 5% of Catholic parishioners ever hear anything said from the pulpit and that's the only time they get exposed to the church? How can they do that if only 5% of evangelical pastors talk about responsibility to nature? I think another thing I'd say is that uh, the Catholic moral position believes in the sanctity of life, which I think, if anything is a core value, that's the core value to Catholicism. And the debate within <coughs> Catholicism has been over whether that is reducible to the issue of reproductive ethics, of the sanctity of the unborn. And um, my favorite churchman of the 20th century, Cardinal Bernadette, made a strong plea that we need to think of life as a seamless, the ethic of life as a seamless garment. It includes the very young, but also the very old, those who are poor and of limited means, and those who are on the margins of society because of mental illness uh, that's, and the severely demented. But also, the consistent ethic of life needs to extend to all life and not just human life. 
And it doesn't mean that all life is equal, um, that we have just a flat moral valuation because some forms of life are higher and more developed than others. But it, all of life counts. And in fact, we kind of sink or swim together. We can't say, well, we'll sacrifice the trees and we'll sacrifice the Amazon so that we can survive. It doesn't work that way, of course. For the, us to flourish, the natural world has to flourish. Yeah. And I would just add to that that the Evangelical Environmental Network also says that climate change is a pro-life issue because life doesn't end at birth. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, so I'm an alum, and I guess I just want to pick up, uh, it seems to me like a natural segue from the last point, particularly around Boston College. So you cited uh, the last three popes and the bishops' conference and the fact that still there's only 5% of people. I, I don't think I've ever heard Sean O'Malley say anything about, uh, about, about climate being an important issue. Um, so I guess I want to bring it closer to home, and that's Boston College. Uh, so how come Boston College and the theology department and Father Leahy and whoever else don't have an explicit position saying this is a really top priority. We not only want people of the School of Theology and Ministry to understand this should be f front and central, but we want this to be something that we communicate to all our students. It should be something that's you know, on the front burner and not left up to a few students now and again trying to uh, rally <coughs> a little bit of support with indifferent support from the the, not only the higher ups of the administration, but it seems uh, hopefully uh, faculty who, I mean, I heard your words were, were very powerful about this is an ethical responsibility. How, what do we need to do to put that into action? Thanks. Well, I think one thing we need to do is divest. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, and there's, there's a march on Sunday? Is it Sunday? You're at BC? Correct. We have meetings on Tuesday that I have a flyer. Yeah. But I think <laughs> there, that the, the, there are a lot of, you, you pointed to a lot of bodies at BC, uh, a lot of aspects of the institution. The university as such doesn't take a policy stance on things. And I think that's what Father Leahy would say. I think we do have a lot of faculty that are interested and considered and, and committed. Uh, but it's, it's, I'd say that the passion here is kind of muted and that uh, that we really need to take it more seriously. Uh, and I think that there's more passion among a small group of students. But that needs to, that needs to be developed, to be encouraged. So that's one reason I'm really glad Eric was able to sponsor this and hopefully other events like this. Um, there are theologians in the department that are very committed. I have a colleague right here, John McDar. Uh, academics tend to work in silos. We tend to do our research on 14th century you know, uh, British poetry or on uh, how stained glass chemistry works uh, or on you know, um, a, an account of the sociology of lost tribes in the Amazon and so forth. And you're, you're, res you're supposed to resist generalization because it makes you dumb. But I do think this is, if you, if you believe this is the primary moral issue of the day, and that there's a lot at stake in this. I think that, that we could think of this climate change issue as analogous to the civil rights in the way that they came to, to pervade college campuses. The debates, the action, the conversation about civil rights pervaded Catholic campuses in the 60s, and we need to make this as the issue for the next decade and on. So I, I think what you're saying is exactly right. Thanks, Steve. Let's get another question. We had a hand up front, yes. Hi, um, my name is Erin. I'm um, a member of the divestment campaign here at BC and a faith organizer for a larger divestment network, also a Catholic and aspiring scientist. So I love what all you said. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering because it's been hinted at, especially in your slides, uh, Catherine, when you showed um, the different like religious sects split up. It seemed that like white Catholics and white Protestants um, were the least concerned about climate change. And I was thinking in contrast to the environmental and conservationist movements, you know, you think of John Weir and the, C Muir and the Sierra Club, and that's traditionally a very white kind mm -hmm. of movement as opposed to this climate justice movement, 
which has like, so I was just wondering if we could speak about like why people are more resistant to like climate justice as opposed to environmentalism and you know like this like why white people you know maybe with a certain amount of privilege are like more resistant and are less concerned even if they believe in climate change. Great question. Yeah, I would just say in a nutshell that people resist something they perceive to threaten things they hold dear. And so that is where, wherever we see the resistance, um, it's not a case of trying to overcome resistance with facts. Facts have been shown to actually harden resistance. We have to identify the root of the fear. It all comes down to the emotion of fear. People are afraid that something we cherish, it could be our freedom, it could be our comfortable lives, it could be our identity, will be ripped away from us if we agree with the science and say that we need solutions to this issue. And so I think that that perspective helps us to be a bit more understanding sometimes. Um, but it also helps us, I think, communicate more effectively. Rather than you know, hitting each other upside the head with, with facts and <clears throat> figures, connecting from here can be very powerful and can often even lead us to some surprising agreements um, once if, if once we're willing to open up and talk about that. So that's the advice I always give people on Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> well, what if, uh, building on the question, what if the fear that our comfortable lives will somehow become less comfortable, what if that's right? What then? Uh-huh. I mean, <laughs> first of all, I think they will definitely become a lot less comfortable if we allow climate change to continue. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that as humans, I honestly think there's some physiological resistance as well, just the way our brains are built. We don't, a lot of us don't like change. We don't want to do things a different way. Um, and this involves a big change. Um, so that's why I think talking about solutions is so important. And it's something I had to educate myself on. Because I'm a physical scientist. I don't do solutions. That's an engineering thing. <laughs> I do science. I had to educate myself on solutions because if we're presented with awesome solutions, we'll get on board. Mm. Let me put it this way. Who here has one of those old cell phones that's this big? Anybody? No, why not? It's because the new ones are cooler and they're much more awesome, right? So in the same thing, if we have climate solutions that are the iPhone 6, people will want them. Right now, we've been presented with climate solutions that are England in the Revolutionary War, and nobody wants them. Other questions? Uh, well, Professor Ebel, and then we'll come to the middle. Over, uh, yeah, Evan, Evan, here. First. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Professor John Ebel, and I'm the chair of the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And in answer to the question mm -hmm. earlier, there actually is an awful lot of work that's being done on the campus uh, on issues related to global climate change at the scientific level. Uh, we have faculty in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences who specifically are, who, who are specifically studying this particular topic. Uh, it's been, uh, we've had courses for years on the scientific aspects of this, of this question. Uh, it's now a focus of our uh, new uh, environmental studies major and has been a focus of our environmental studies minor. And um, right now the science departments are developing a new strategic plan for the sciences at Boston College. And two of the three pillars of that are actually an environment and energy. And so global climate change will obviously be one of the, the uh, issues that will be coming up in in those uh, pillars. Let's have one last brief question. Uh, the gentleman here. Evan, can you grab? He's got a microphone for you. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. It was uh, great to hear both speakers. And uh, I will refer to um, uh, Dr. Pope uh, when he uh, referred to the uh, uh, Catholic ethical principles number seven. And I didn't catch everything, but Finally, that moral decisions uh, occur through the virtue of prudence. And then coming to the U.S. Bishop uh, uh, Congress uh, with the, the conclusion about the obligation about looking at the scientific facts and taking mitigating action. And uh, 
a little later on, you then pointed out that scientists who start to, uh, how you say, go whole hog in uh, attacking uh, religious perspectives. I sort of put all those together, and I think that one thing that we, we really need to do is to give people a more of a positive attitude that uh, how we can overcome this. And I look back, and it's going back into the 80s and the early 90s, and we did something that today would be impossible. And we gotta go back to that to see what we did. And it's not as big a problem, but it was a very big problem that we successfully uh, tackled and on the way to beating because it's going to take a long time. And that's uh, the diminishment of the ozone layer and the uh, restrictions, severe restrictions on our way of life with the chlorofluorocarbons. And that, that success we've sort of put aside, but it has a lot of the aspects that we need to overcome the global warming issue. Right. And as I say, it was a remarkable success. And as it progressed, we went even further. We accelerated the, uh, the, the uh, banning of these uh, chemicals. And if you can imagine, the, the people we have today would have raised the issues against that, uh, we would be in a really horrible situation today. And so I'd like somebody to just kind of analyze the similarities and uh, that do we need not uh, point this out over and over again to the objectors? Well, fortunately, we have an atmospheric scientist present yes, uh, who can help with this. <laughs> yes, and I, I am the academic great-granddaughter of one of those chemists who won the Nobel Prize for the ozone hole research. Who is it? <laughs> Which one? Um, it was my advisor's advisor, Sherry is Rowland. It? I'll be yes. Um, so that was a tremendous success. And it's, it was such a success that I even wrote a chapter about it in the book I wrote, you know, what we learned from science, how we put it into place, and the fact that the ozone level layer is starting to recover. We've actually measured the beginning of the recovery, although it will take some time. Here's the difference. Where were those chemicals? They were in our air conditioners. They were in our refrigerators. They were in our hairspray cans. And they were in our Nike Air shoes. Where are fossil fuels? everywhere. That is why we certainly have a lot to learn from it, but climate change is orders of magnitude bigger because it pervades every aspect of society. But thank you for that comment because that is definitely something that we can learn from. Well, we have uh, reached the end of our time here, but not the end of the conversation. I hope that you'll leave this room with a little better understanding of the challenges we're facing, but also a little more of a hopeful understanding of what we can do in the future as well. Our most important task is to complete the cookie uh, table uh, right. that's outside of the back door. Yes. Thank you to Gus and Student Affairs for that. But mostly thank you to our speakers for a terrific presentation. Thank you.